Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego, albeit a rainy San Diego today, unusually. And I'm joined by Moed Amin, who is in London, England, where it's no stranger to rain and neither is it like where I'm originally from, from Dublin either, but uh, hopefully uh, things are good over there. How are you doing, Moed? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, funnily enough, it is raining today in London, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's raining in London, I pretty much guarantee it's probably raining in Dublin too. So. Yeah, true. Um, and what we want to talk about today is trust building and particularly um, you know, Moid's background with, uh, with neuroscience and learning the evolution of the brain structure and in the impact this has on the psychology of decision making. So, I, I mean, Moid, trust has always been a big part of, of sales and business in general, like going back, you know, to, you know, times, you know, going back to the beginning of time almost. But it still seems to be a thing that people don't really understand in many ways. They kind of almost uh, have a nebulous kind of understanding of what trust really means. And that and and, you know, even from a buyer side, from a seller side. So can you talk a little bit about maybe frame the conversation for us around trust? Yeah, let's start at the yeah, start at the beginning. I mean, it's true that we seem to still, as a sales profession, mm. right? We seem to still struggle with both recognizing and truly understanding that trust is so vital to being a successful salesperson. Um, and it's, it's just not being, it's not being taught, right? And I've, I've been involved in so many training programs, both as a, as a recipient and giving it. And I don't think I've ever heard, apart from me, obviously doing it because that's that's one of the areas I'm passionate about. But you know, I don't think I've ever heard trust being brought up as part of that training curriculum. Um, so the reality is that uh, let's let's use some examples. LinkedIn did a survey. Um, they did a study, sorry, last year about the state of sales, and one of the findings was that forty percent of buyers feel that the sales profession is untrustworthy. Mm. The same find, the same research found that 25% of buyers feel that the whole sales profession is, quote, morally and ethically challenged, end quote, right? And to me, that wasn't surprising. However, it was truly disheartening to hear. So we still seem to have a, a, a long way to go to convince buyers as a whole that our profession is a trustworthy profession. And, and we're, we're the owners of that. And we don't seem to be conducting ourselves no, no, in that way. And there are whole different reasons why some of it is top-down pressure from investors and business leaders. Some of it is that we're bottom up where we're just not taught about that. And, and you're right, it does feel nebulous, but actually it isn't. And I've, I've done some, a huge amount of research over quite a few years to understand and almost formalize what is it that makes someone trustworthy and how can you conduct yourself in that trustworthy way? Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating what you outlined there in the statistics, and I and I totally agree. And obviously, it hasn't been helped because the only portrayals we see in popular culture of salespeople are pretty negative ones. And I think often when 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 we engage with the salesperson, even if you're in sales yourself, when you engage with the salesperson as a buyer, you tend to get defensive from the outset just because of this. So the the salesperson has an obstacle to overcome immediately. Um, so let's let's dive in a little bit into into trust. As you say, you mean you've done a lot of research into it, and you say it can be identified, it can be taught, it can be codified in many ways. So um, explain that. Yeah. So. Um, Stephen Covey, the famous author of uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, once wrote that trust is where uh, character and competence converge. You need to have both. Now, it, instinctively, mm -hmm. I thought in my head, when I first r read that, I asked myself, well, which one's more important, right? Is, is it character or trust? And uh, luckily, we have people we can turn to to ask about that. So Warren Buffett, um, once uh, when he was asked how does he hire what does he look for when he hires someone he says that he looks for three things integrity energy and intelligence he also went on to say that if someone doesn't have someone 
doesn't have the first one, the last two will kill you. And he's not the only one. Um, so many people have expressed their strong views and opinion and experience that character is more important than competence. Doesn't mean that if you just have the right characteristics without the competence, then you're trustworthy. You still need both. But if you're choosing between whether someone that has just competence or has both, you will most certainly choose one, uh, the, the one that has both. We used to in Gartner, and I used to be a commercial leader in Gartner, in our uh, training programs, and especially in our interview process, and I, I interviewed hundreds of sales yeah. candidates, we were more interested in the traits of that person. Because if they had the right traits, then we could train them. And we were confident in our training process. So character is really important. And I will come on to that. The competence is difficult to codify for everyone because that, that's really skills. And skills are, is determined by the business you work in, the industry yeah. you work with, industry you sell to, all of that. But there will be general things like uh, you know, the knowledge that you have, both product, but also business acumen. Right? Do yeah. I understand the business that I'm talking to? Can I have those kind of conversations? Um, you will also have things like um, professionalism, which is more character actually, but the other one will be, you know, do I come to the conversation uh, having done my research, having done my homework? Do I have something of value to add through the, through the knowledge and the skills that I have? Um, in my sales process, am I professional in terms of the way I conduct that sales process? Do I have the skills for things like diagnosis, you know, negotiating and things like that? The character is the one I want to spend more time on because that mm -hmm. is the more nebulous. Yeah, because I, just just before you leave the others, I mean, part of what yeah. you outlined there, part of the there are a lot of things that to be honest, that you can take care of yourself. Like you can work on your business acumen. You can you can make sure that you know you you are good at communicating. You can you can learn about your products. You can learn about the business and the, of, of business, the business of your buyers. All of those are fine. Now that's why I'm interested as we get into the character part because uh, you know some people would argue like character is innate maybe or you know how do you develop how do you develop and 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 progress character. Not true at all. That's like saying that salespeople are born, not made, which mm -hmm. is total rubbish, right? And, and the research, there was a research done that was published in 2006 in Harvard Business Review that looked at the six traits of top selling, um, top performing salespeople. They were not what typically is regarded as the top traits, right? So sure. lack of gregariousness, conscientiousness, <laughs> those things. Now, to talk about the competence, just one final thing. It, yeah need to have a higher level of competence right you do need to kind of exceed the expectations of the buyer so that they feel comfortable right that you can not only deliver on on what they need right now and have the skills to do so but also do so in the future right so it's not about just having a minimal amount of competence sure 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 and i think that goes to like how serious you are about your your craft or uh, your profession about whether you're willing to put in the extra work to get to that level uh, absolutely Absolutely. And I wish, I wish enough people had uh, that, that attitude and approach. They don't, but that's what separates the, the better from, from those mm -hmm. who aren't. The character part. Right. So um, through all my research, I found that there are eight characteristics of, of trustworthiness. And these are evergreen. What I want to make clear before I talk about these eight is you cannot show up with these eight in your professional life and not in your personal life. It, it is part of your character, right? The, 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 yeah. the, the uh, what do you call it? The, the, the core is in the name, right? It's, it's in the yeah. character, the clue is there. So the first one is uh, authenticity. And it's, I put this one first because of a couple of reasons. Authenticity is about, you know, speaking and acting uh, in line with your beliefs and values, right? And people can subconsciously sense when you're not doing that. Right? At the very minimum, they could subconsciously censor that. And when it comes to trust, it, even the subconscious can, can be enough to say, Do you know what, I don't have, I don't feel comfortable enough, I'm not going to take that risk. The other reason why it's so important and why it's first is you, buyers can, and buyers have five to 10 years on average more experience buying than sellers have selling, right? So they know right. the game better mm -hmm. than the average seller. Um, if, if, they are, if they are face to face with a seller, who doesn't feel confident about the solution they're selling, 
doesn't believe in it, doesn't seem to align with their values and beliefs, buyers can sense that. So as a sales leader, you need to make sure that you know, what's important is that what you're offering is in line with that person's beliefs or values. So authenticity is the first one. The next one's consistency. Consistency in approach, consistency in professionalism, consistency in how you conduct yourself with the buyer, consistency in the quality of what you deliver to them, both as a prospect and as a client, right? Um, you know, we see too many account managers where at the beginning of the relationship, they're incredibly oh. professional, diligent, you know, they do all the right things. But then as the relationship progresses and that buyer becomes a loyal customer, you start to see that that level of professionalism and, and quality declines. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, it is. It is one of the fundamental mistakes that our, our companies often make and people often make. It's uh, you know, yeah. you, you work with the salesperson, you have a great experience and everything, and then you, you become a customer and you call up that salesperson because you have an issue, and they say, "Yeah, let me connect you with uh, with support," and you suddenly go, "Oh, so I don't matter anymore." Yeah. And by the way, that comes onto one of the further qualities that I will talk about, the further characteristics. Mm -hmm. Really, really important, that consistency. Uh, third one's integrity. Don't need to labor this one too much. It's mm -hmm. are you honest? Or are, you, are you truthful and are you honest? Are you just giving promises that you can't deliver because you think it's going to get you the sale? Uh, or are you being honest about it? And there's a whole amount of research and experience that shows how to do that, how to be honest about some of the, not failures, but some of the things that your product or solution can't do mm -hmm. compared to others, but actually making that uh, a benefit for the buyer as well with, in an ethical way. Um, the next one's responsibility and accountability, which ties into the example you just yeah. gave, right? Am I, does the buyer feel that the seller is responsible and accountable towards delivering and their promises of success? that the sellers are too often loud and, and, and available when things are going well, but when something doesn't go well, all of a sudden the, the support person, the technical person comes in at the forefront and they kind of almost hide behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and buyers know things aren't perfect and things go wrong. They want someone that they can trust to see them through any of those situations, right? Yeah, how, um, on, on that note, how often have you seen somebody um, when when they've had an issue and they call up and the and the person says okay let me look into it and then they come back a little while later and say listen I'm sorry I still don't have the answer we're still trying to figure this out but I just wanted to let you know that we're still working on it when that happens to you 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 feel so okay these people care as opposed to the people who say yeah I'll go I'll go figure that out and then you don't hear back and you're like have you figured it out yet have you figured it out yet and they're like oh, oh we're still working on it but that proactive thing is what makes you feel like they care uh, absolutely and, and and I've seen it a lot but I think I see it more in in junior sales people those with less experience than say the more senior ones but but even with the senior ones it it can happen and and one of the worst things for salespeople is we're almost trained that not having an answer is like the worst possible thing. So they would rather not turn up with an answer, but actually that's the worst because you're sitting there thinking, what's going on? What's happening? My business yeah, yeah. is being, right? So, um, and I don't think salespeople are, are really trained to be able to take that ownership in that way. So I, yeah. I see it more often than I would really like. And and just uh, and just by the just by the way on that as well when you're talking about you know a trust a trust in general, um, do you really trust somebody who seems to have an answer for everything, or do you trust somebody who has the confidence to say, hmm, no, I actually I don't have an answer for that, or no, I don't know that, or I, I haven't come across that before, and then like, let me look into it, or simply like, sorry, that's not my area. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I, I haven't researched this. Uh, it, that element fully because um it, there, but there is anecdotal and empirical evidence right and it's based upon the recipient some recipients want someone to have all the answers for them that's what trust is others and i saw this on shark tank once and i can't remember the name of the lady De De i can't remember her name but someone was um giving a great pitch and he had all the answers and he had the right answers for her, she said, I'm not going to invest with you because you had all the right, all the right answers. It sounded too slick for me. Mm. Whereas someone else on that shark tank said, actually, I like that, right? So it's very personal. What mm. I can say that I have studied is 
if you don't have the answer and you try to wing it and you try to lie your way out of it, a lot of buyers will sense that and that's worse. So what I do know from evidence is if you don't have the answer, don't lie. Say I don't have the answer, but here's what makes someone trustworthy. Say, look, I don't have the answer now. Here is how I'm going to find that answer. And here is when I'm going to get back to you. And you deliver on that, right? So again, we don't want, always want someone to have the answers. We just want someone with the, with the right characteristics and the competencies to get the answers for us and help us along the way. Does that answer your question? No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, right? It's, it's, and it's a difficult one because it's very personal <laughs> to each person sometimes. Um, so where are we? Guilt worthiness is the next one. This one's really surprising. There was a study done by the University of Chicago, uh, and it's published in, in a few journals that found that people who felt guilty about past actions inspired a huge amount of trust in, in, in other people. Um, we've all done things that we are maybe not so proud of. Um, but if you come across someone that doesn't feel that guilt, you're, it's almost like saying you're coming across someone that doesn't have a conscience, mm. right? Because they didn't feel guilty about something that where they've wronged someone and they don't care. So as a buyer, you're like, well, if you wrong me, you basically are not going to care about it, right? And that, that is so bad. As a sales leader, and by the way, all these principles can be applied as a sales leader between the relationship between sales leader and seller. Yeah. As a sales leader, so what I do, what I advise a lot of my clients, and I have quite a few uh, founder clients, CEO clients um, who are starting to scale their sales team, they may not know how to hire salespeople. One of the questions I encourage them to add in there is, tell me about a time when you felt guilty about a past action describe to me the situation what happened and what what did you do about it how did you approach it if someone doesn't have a coherent answer or hesitates that should send alarm bells ringing for you yeah yeah it's a it's a fascinating one what did you call it guilt worthiness worthiness yeah mm -hmm. and and how might that manifest itself in i mean how would somebody know that in in say a sales in a sales transaction yeah it, so Buyers are really savvy and they will have done their homework about, about you and about what you have to offer. Um, Gartner did a research where they found that, you know, in the buying process, only about 19% of that time is where the buyer engages with a seller or a supplier. Mm -hmm. The rest of that time, they're doing their own research. And these are smart individuals. They will have read, we live in a radically transparent world. So there are reviews, there are ways to find information about you as a seller and your company to understand, um, you know, pretty much most of, most of the things about the business. What did, you, what did you do well and what you didn't do well? Let's take Zoom as an example. At the beginning of the COVID crisis, Zoom had security issues. Um, and rather than hide behind that, the CEO did something amazing, which was to, to stand up to it, to own it, to even communicate and say, look, these are the things that we're doing. And he and the whole business delivered on that, which inspired mm -hmm. a huge amount of confidence and trust. Um, now, if someone was to ask that CEO uh, later on and say, you know, tell, was there anything about that process that, you know, didn't, you didn't feel comfortable about? As a buyer, you can almost approach, now when you approach Zoom, if you're a big buyer for Zoom, you can ask them about that. And the way that they respond, if they try to brush it under the carpet or they don't feel a certain amount of guilt or at least owning to it, you can tell straight away. So that's probably one of the best examples right. I can give. You know, you know the businesses you're about to talk to and you know their faults as well as their strengths. And you can ask them about that and see how they react to it. That's fascinating. Um, the penultimate one is generosity. Um, and I, this one came later because I conducted an extra study with that. I wanted to find out if, if someone who's generous on its own without exhibiting the other seven characteristics, does that inspire trust or do you need at least one or two of the others as well? It turns out that you do need one or two of the others. Um, John, if someone approached you with a, a generous offer, one of the instincts you'll probably have is, is this someone, is this person trying to buy my loyalty? Right. Yeah, or what's the catch? You're loading there because you've probably come across this, right? You're ahead of marketing. You know, you guys get sold to a lot. Right? So um, 
you, 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 so it turns out you need to have the other characteristics, but generosity is hugely powerful because you are giving something. Yes, you're expecting something in return, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get that in return. And if done in the right way while exhibiting the other characteristics, it shows a huge amount of energy towards helping that other person. And, and, and psychologically, we feel affinity towards people like that. And, and I think one of, one of the things here, um, just, to, just to focus in on, because this is, this is fascinating, but I think sometimes people think, they think of generosity in narrow terms, whereas generosity, uh, you, know, you don't have to have money or goodies or things to give away to be generous. It can be your time, it can be your insight, it can be your listening, it can be, there's so many things, but I totally agree with you. There's, I don't know whether you have that, uh, but there's the next door app, you know, where you have all the neighborhoods and people on yeah. neighborhoods, like they talk about all of that stuff. If I was to say, um, unfortunately it got over, overloaded with a lot of political nonsense. But if other than that, if I would say the most positive posts and the ones that get the most reaction are uh, stories of small acts of generosity, kindness like that. And I think that's to your point. I think there's so many ways in which one can be generous, but I don't think people always realize how, you know, the, the generosity that there's so many different ways of displaying it. And here's my answer to that. A lot of people and, and in society, this has now been perpetuated. We have a finite view of what value is. Yeah. And it also relates to self-worth. Unfortunately, it's tied to money. And I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I'm guilty of this as well, right? We live in that society. Yeah. But, but, you know, what you talked about, money, time, those are mechanisms of value, right? Um, I, I've worked for charities where we support orphanages in third world countries. And yes, the money is important. But I, when I went there and we spent time with the children, um, actually orphans don't just want the money, they want the connection. They want mm -hmm. that human contact, right? That it's so important to them. So just being there and just spending time with them and being that role model for them, right? That is more valuable in some ways than the money, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think it's about exchanging value right your knowledge your time your experience even doing manual labor because it's still going to be valuable it's about just giving to help rather than giving to just receive right not saying there isn't a receiving element there, there absolutely is um but yeah that's how i would that's how i think about what you just described uh, no absolutely um and the final the final one is agreeableness now this is not yeah. about being a yes person this is about empathy the word influence comes from the Latin word influere, which is to flow with. And I liken this as to a river. We're trained in sales that when someone, and by the way, I hate this term objection handling, but let's use it because mm -hmm. it's a commonly understood term. You know, we're trained that when someone throws an objection, it is a situation that we have to figure out how to get around. We, we, yeah. we are trained to agree with it as if we're going to trick the person that we're going to psychologically kind of state change their state uh, their ch shift their state and then we try to sidestep it or we tell them the 10 point reason as to why they need to think about what we have to say or why they're wrong but 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 people's minds don't work like that um agreeableness is about getting into the river and flowing with them to understand them before finding a way to actually veer them towards a better a better opinion or better understanding or better data facts etc it's about stepping way over the line into their world and giving them that courtesy and respect to understand how they came across that opinion and why that's important to them before giving your point of view and just saying, maybe there's, here's another way of thinking about it. Most salespeople arrogantly expect that the buyer should meet them in the middle. Hey, you're the one that called on them, right? They, they shouldn't be expected to take the energy to come uh, to where you believe is the middle ground yeah. right so show them that courtesy and respect be agreeable rather than being the dam in the river that tries to block it 
Um, yeah, there's just one in, one thing on that on the on the empathy bit because I do feel like empathy. It's such a term that's just thrown around all the time now. It's almost become a buzzword now. It's almost like oh, you know, the last couple of years have been the years of every salespeople need to be empathetic, and and I and I still don't think that a lot of people really understand what empathy really is. Some people confuse it with sympathy. Some people, as you say, oh, I'll put myself in their shoes and then I'll just agree with everything they say, as opposed to the real thing about empathy, as you said, is really getting in the river and going with them. And it may be telling them something, maybe delivering hard messages sometimes to say, you know, OK, from I understand where you are. But if you continue on this road, this will happen or whatever. And I think people misunderstand that sometimes. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and you know, that example you gave is about being tactful, right, as well. Yeah. It's not just about just about being abrasive. Yeah. And here's how I think of empathy. It's a human to human connection, right? Empathy, like empathy is astral plane projection. It's, it's almost kind of, it's, it's almost kind of becoming that person and seeing the world through their eyes. And what that means is, um, you know, understanding their social profile. Are they, and there, there are so many different um, frameworks for that, but, you know, using the Miller, Miller Reed framework, are they an analytical person or a driver or an expressive or an amiable? Because that's how they see the world, right? Um, you know, do I take the time to understand why they have that point of view and what's really behind that point of view? So asking questions but for the purpose of not just because you're trained to do so sales, because that's how you can get the sale, mm -hmm. asking questions because you really want to understand their point of view. So for me, it's about human connection and it's about fully understanding the person. Sympathy is not that, right? Sympathy is just, uh, you know, supporting them. But yeah. empathy is truly understanding who they are and how they see the world, and more importantly, how they see their place in that world, which is hugely important. So what are the things that drive them? How do they view the world? Why do they come to that opinion? And, and by the way, there's a psychological prin principle where you, know, you can do a, almost a pattern interrupt. By doing that, they're more open to hearing your point of view because you've just given them that courtesy, right? You just mm. show them that respect by saying do you know what i want to understand you right let's talk about that and i can share my opinion as well yeah and i think you just touched on something there is that that idea of respect and i think that's a thing too that sometimes is overlooked is just having the respect for the other person not seeing them as a as a prospect or not seeing them as a as a number or whatever but seeing them as a as a human being and because i always think that sometimes in sales, particularly in, in B2B sales, right, is uh, the sellers often overlook the fact that the the buyer is making a decision or maybe making it as a team, but ultimately it's always connected to somebody. And that can be a career enhancing uh, thing if, the, if whatever's purchased turns out well, or it can be a career limiting one if it doesn't turn out well. So there's a lot of pressure on the buyer. And I think sometimes we, we forget that and and we don't empathize and we don't have the respect to know okay this is a difficult decision for them not just from a company point of view but from a personal point of view too absolutely and, and look look i, I want to make clear that there are a lot of sellers out there that exemplify the, th the great things sure. that we're talking about right and that's what separates them unfortunately because there's so many that don't they really shine out as a beacon of, of mm. professionalism right but you're absolutely right. People almost, they believe that we're selling to a CMO, but not a person, right? They are personal decisions. You, you've touched on something else that I talk, I really talk about very passionately, which is buyers hate the buying process. They mm -hmm. hate it because it's complex. Um, it takes time away from what they are kind of almost gold to do, right, sometimes. Um, but the other thing is that, um, Every that decision that they make, whether they go with you or not, people think, well, if I show them a value proposition, right? If I show them ROI, it's a no brainer. No, if when they make a decision about whether they go with your product or someone else's, they're also putting their, their ego, their reputation, and as you said, even their livelihood at risk, mm -hmm. because when they make that decision, all eyes on, are on them now to see whether they made that right decision. And if it's really bad, they could lose their job. And, and I, you're right. I don't believe 
sellers truly appreciate that. It's quite a lot of sellers anyway, truly don't appreciate that. And in some ways, I don't, I don't believe from my observations that the sales leaders kind of communicate that appreciation to the salespeople as well. I don't think enough time is spent on doing that. I've trained so many salespeople and I always ask this question in my training programs. Tell me about the top KPIs, MBOs of the buyer that you're selling to. Tell me how are they going to be bonused? Mm -hmm. And I am shocked by how few cannot answer that question. Now, that just, that tells you everything, right? They, they haven't taken the time to understand and empathize with the buyer. They haven't taken the time to even understand what will motivate them and why they'll want to talk to you. Um, and, and, you know, the sales leaders have the knowledge and should have the resources to get those answers and that knowledge to their salespeople, but they don't seem to do it for some reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And that's why, and that's why I, I honestly believe that's why you hear the, a, a big complaint about not losing to competitors, but losing to losing to no decisions. And I think if you don't do what we're talking about here and you don't understand what's going on, well, then sometimes making no decision sounds like a better deal for the for the for the buyer because let's face it if you don't do something you can't really get blamed for it and, and there's an evolutionary principle to that right so back in you know 60 to 100,000 years ago most people talk about uh, fight or flight but actually there's a there's another one that people don't realize um fight or flight back then when you had to actually ex, ex, uh, use up energy to find food it was an expensive process running, right? It was very energy intensive. You do not want to waste that energy. So what we used to do was when we hear a rustling behind us, we would stop and listen, gather information before we did very energy intensive activities like fight or flight. That is status quo. It is safer to just take a no decision than it is to do something else. So yeah, I, I totally No, it's agree. funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I saw a comedian the other day who was saying, you know, uh, about the hunter hunter gatherers. What I was saying, we're not descended from the guys who charged out there. You know, this we're 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 descended from the smart ones who hid back in the caves. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and stayed quiet until the yeah, stay quiet. until they figured out what it was. Yes, I agree. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, well, listen, my this has been fantastic. I mean, so much fantastic insight there. Um, and trust such a such a I mean, it's such an incredibly important thing. And I think not just in business, but in life in general. And we live in a we live in a world that's crying out for from way more trust building. So this has been fantastic. All of Moid's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, so um after just about over 15 years of B2B sales, um, I realized that although I was great at sales, I truly enjoyed and excelled even further on training salespeople. And I did that for the companies where I was a sales leader. Um, so I created my own business called Proverbial Door. And uh, what we do is we're sales consultants and advisors to founders of scaling up businesses, those that just had Series A, Series B funding, and they're trying to create a, an amazing sales function and they don't know how to do that. But I also train and coach salespeople to consistently hit 120% and above, really to raise their income above that six level, six, uh, six figure level. Um, so our training is based upon neuroscience and, and um, uh, behavioral psychology. So both in the principles as well as in the structure of the training as well, because it's about memorizing and creating that change of habits and patterns. So even our training programs are structured with that in mind. Uh, but we work with B2B companies, uh, specific, well, more often than not within the subscription-based businesses. So they could be market intelligence, SaaS-based businesses, software, et cetera. But it's not limited to that, but that's the area that we do a lot of work in. Um, so that's 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 the work that we do right now. Yeah, fantastic. And I would I would encourage people to check it out because as we emerge from this uh, strange period that we were uh, we have lived through, there's going to be a dogfight for business. So um, the better prepared you are, the better skills. If you can if you can develop the traits and that that uh, Moid is outlining here, I think it'll put you in a much better position. So I would encourage you to check out uh, check out Moid and what he offers. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just one more, one more final sure. point. It's not all just uh, neuroscience and research. 
over that time period, I've spoken to and interviewed almost 400 buyers across 10 industries. Uh -huh. Almost every single one of them, upon investigation and really digging in, the reason why they selected a seller compared to others came down to honesty and trust. Those were the two words that they used. So this is, if 400 buyers are saying this, people please listen. This is really, really, really important. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. If 400 buyers are saying it, then the chances are like 1,000, 4,000, 10,000 would give you the pretty much the same result. Um, okay, well, listen, thanks again, Moid. Uh, it's been fantastic. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.